Praise the Lord. Oh, let's say praise the Lord three times. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. As we come to the last message, I just hope that the Lord would really touch us with all his speaking in the last nine messages or the last eight messages uh, that we have gone into. You know, I really praise the Lord that such a speaking was given. You know, the general subject is a very important thing for us to remember. So how about let's all recite the general subject. No, Ron was the one who composed this general subject and in his fellowship with the church in Anaheim he said that this is very much in his heart and he believed that what he has come from the throne came from the ascended Christ you know so when he composed this he was very careful as to how to compose this general subject the general subject goes propagating the resurrected, ascended, and all-inclusive Christ as the development of the kingdom of God. You know, just like Brother Lee, prepositions such as as here is very important. So it was through much prayer and consideration before the Lord that he wrote this uh, title, this subject as the propagating of the resurrected, ascended, and all-inclusive Christ, not for the development of the kingdom of God, but as the development of the kingdom of God. And I believe this is very good, because this actually makes the meaning a lot more accurate. And it is actually more transcendent, it is more uplifting, and the revelation is much clearer for us to see that this propagating work that we are doing, this propagation is actually the propagation of a person. And this person is the development of the kingdom of God. Oh, just like our brother just shared, this development is the development of this very person. You know, so as we come to this last message, you know, we see that the title is the Divine Commission according to the heavenly vision for the continuation of the book of Acts in the unique flow of the divine stream. You know, there is a lot of thing that is actually spoken in this title. So this title, actually this message, could be considered as a summary of the whole nine messages, or all the eight messages plus the nine messages. So here we want to see the divine commission, which is the commission that Paul has. And since we are seeing that Paul is a pattern for us to all follow, Paul's commission should be our commission. Okay, Paul's commission is to be according, is to be our commission. And this Paul's commission, or this divine commission, is very much according to the heavenly vision. According to this heavenly vision, praise the Lord, we need to have a proper understanding of what this heavenly vision is all about. Praise the Lord for the last eight outlines. It seems like what the brother is trying to do is to show us this heavenly vision in many aspects of the vision. Oh, praise the Lord, this heavenly vision is like a diamond. But the diamond is many facets. You know, by going through all these different outlines that we just covered, I hope we would all see what this heavenly vision is all about. Oh, praise the Lord. You know, I am so glad that the Lord brought this to us in this last Itiro in Addis Ababa. Oh, praise the Lord. You know, thinking back, I am sure glad that the Lord brought me there to listen to such messages. 
And I also praise the Lord very much that He is bringing these messages to all of us. So I just hope that we would all pray very much that these words, this speaking of the Lord regarding the divine commission of this heavenly vision would not go back to the Lord void. That such speaking would actually touch our very heart. You know, just like Victor shared some messages ago, this is a training. So may we return another person. We would not go home the same as before we came. Oh, may these messages really touch our very heart to cause us to rise up, to be able to be one with the Lord for the fulfilling of His eternal purpose. And just like Paul, I hope we could all tell the Lord one day when we meet him, we are not going to meet King Agrippa. Forget about King Agrippa. You know, one day we are going to meet the Lord. And I hope we could all tell the Lord, I am not disobedient to this heavenly vision. Oh, may the Lord really have mercy on us. So we will not be disobedient to this heavenly vision. So many times we talk about the heavenly vision. You know, this heavenly vision should be seen by us, but should also be renewed by us day by day. Oh, to keep us in this heavenly vision. You know, we all heard what Broly shared one time. What Broly shared about his relationship with Brother Nee. In 19, uh, I believe in the early 40s, 41, 42 era, you know, when Brother Ni nee was in Shanghai, you know, because of some of the things that happened in the church in Shanghai, you know, Brother Ni nee was not able oh, to minister in that church. You know, but Brother Ni, who was before that in the north of China, came to Shanghai, you know, and when he met Brother Ni nee there, you know, he wants to cheer up Brother Nee. You know, he wants to give some comforting word to Brother Nee. And this is what he told Brother Nee. He said, Brother Nee, even if you will not walk this way, I will still take this way. Because you are the one who infused this heavenly vision to me. And I was so touched by this heavenly vision. So that even one day, if you don't want to walk this way, I still would walk this way. And so, brotherly share, when we come to the Lord's recovery, or when we leave the Lord's recovery, you know, we should never do it because of any person. You know, what should touch us should be this heavenly vision. So, may we all be encouraged Oh, by the repeating of this heavenly vision. You know, this time, as we come to the book of Acts, I was really encouraged by what the Lord is doing. After so much speaking, this time he, we came back to the book of Acts. You know, we have the life study of Acts. We have the crystallization of Acts. You know, but this time, when these nine messages were shared, in Addis Ababa, you could really praise the Lord. That the Lord gave us some fresh speaking. I was specially touched that today we are in the continuation of the book of Acts. You know, the book of Acts ended in chapter 28, but we are all in chapter 29. Chapter 29 is a long chapter. I hope that everything we do, everything we say, all our work is worthy of being recorded in Acts 29. That means, you know, our work should be the following of this heavenly vision. Oh, we all must recognize that although we are in the human history, we are also in the divine history. Oh, this divine history within the human history. You know, this is our history. We are not just people of this world. We actually have this divine history. Okay? 
You know, we are also touched very much, especially from the first message, that Christ, you know, listen to this, Christ has two births. Ever heard, have heard about this? Christ has two births. You know, when he was incarnated, he was born of Mary. Okay, so we all know that. Every Christmas, you know, people celebrate this first birth. Especially in the Philippines. You know, but we need to understand there is another thing that is even more important. This is the second birth of Christ. And he was reborn or born again in his resurrection. He was the only begotten son. But in his rebirth or born again in his resurrection, he became the firstborn son of God. Oh, we need to think about this. Probably always say, think about this. If he's a firstborn, that means we are all hopeful because we are part of the many sons. We are part of the many sons. He's the firstborn, so we can be the many born. We can be the many son. You know, if he is just the only begotten son, then what are we? Oh, praise the Lord. In his regeneration. Actually, he was the first one that got regenerated. You know, he became the firstborn son of God. It is actually the, in this firstborn son of God that we are propagating or that the Lord is propagating. Oh, I just praise the Lord. In this rebirth of Christ, actually, his humanity, the one that was born from Mary, was divinized, was sunized as the Son of God. Praise the Lord. This humanity was uplifted to be the Son of God. Oh, praise the Lord for what he is doing. So today, as we come to this message, I just hope that the Lord would really open our mind to understand the scripture. And he would give us the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Okay? So, when we come to this message, we should consider very much that we are here today. You know, why are we here? You know, why are we here? You know, maybe, you know, we have all our reasoning to be here. But one time, you know, brotherly ask, why are we here? Have you ever asked this question? You know, when brotherly ask a question like this, I really want to go before the Lord and consider, why are we here? We may have a lot of answer to this, but brotherly concluded with this answer. He said, we are here because of the mercy of the Lord. Don't you think it's wonderful? How come among the billions of people on this earth, we are the few that can hear all these things? It is because of the mercy of the Lord. You know, we have this divine life. And at the end, in the New Jerusalem, we would see this divine life would be in the divine nature, the one street, the street of fellowship. This street is the street that flows out from the throne. So if we are in this divine life, following the divine flow, you know, we will never get lost. We don't need any GPS. We don't need any Google Maps. You don't need any ways. We have the divine life in us that will proceed according to this divine nature and flow all the way to the new Jerusalem. Okay, when we come to this message, I believe it is very good for us to come to Roman number one, which says that in the scripture, in the scripture, the concept of divine stream, the unique flow is crucial. The unique flow is crucial. You know, when we hear something like it is crucial, I think it is very good if we would pay attention to this. 
this divine stream is crucial. Because this divine stream is actually the stream of God's word. So where the stream flows, there is the work of God. You know, if you say you're working of God, with God and for God, and you do not have this divine flow, then your work is actually not the divine work. It's not the work of God. You know, so we can say, what kind of work is the work of God? The work of God is actually the work that is in the divine stream. In the divine stream the stream of the living water. We also share in the past messages that on the day of Pentecost, this stream of divine life flowed out of God himself in Christ with the ruling power from the throne. It began to flow from Jerusalem. From there it flowed to Antioch and then from Antioch it turned to the west. It flows to Asia and through Asia it flowed to Macedonia and to Europe. And praise the Lord, from Europe it flows to America, you know, it flows to the Far East, it flows to so many places. And today, we are enjoying this divine flow. By flowing, by flowing, God works. By flowing, God preaches his gospel. And by flowing, God brings people to be saved. It is by this divine flow. That's why this divine flow is very crucial. Okay? And praise the Lord, because this flow is a flow of God's work, which has not stopped. He said, my father is working, and so I am working. Because this flow is not stopping. That's why we say that the book of Acts has no conclusion. There is this opening but there is no conclusion. This is because the stream of life is still flowing and never stops flowing. Okay. Where the stream flows, there is the life of God. Where it flows, there is the fellowship of the body. Where it flows, there is the testimony of Jesus. Where it flows, there is also the work of God. It is the stream of life, the stream of fellowship, the stream of testimony, and the stream of the work of God. This is the stream that we are talking about. This is a very crucial point in the scripture. Okay, if we see some of these uh, references here, you know, from the beginning, even from Genesis 2, we see that there is this flow. There is this flow. It starts all the way from the beginning of the Bible, and it all goes all the way to the end of the Bible, and it will flow into eternity. And the consummation of such flow is actually the new Jerusalem in the new heaven and new earth. Okay, in Genesis 2.10 it says, And the river went, went forth from Eden. Oh, the river went forth from Eden. You know, when we, when we read Eden, I think we should have the understanding that the meaning of Eden is pleasure. You know, it is pleasure. You know, what God actually wants is, and this is what Broly said, what God wants is to actually make us happy. Can you understand that? That's why he put men in the Garden of Eden. What God wants is to make us happy. And because of this, he is not just God, he is actually the flowing God. He will continue to flow to be our life and life supply. If you go to Psalm 46, 4, it says, There is a river whose streams gladden the city of God. Praise the Lord, we have to have these spiritual eyes to see that there is a river whose stream gladdens the city of God. Okay, when we come to the last book of the Bible, you know, to Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, you know, the angel has to show John 
And he said, he showed me a river of water of life, bright as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. You know, this river is going to flow, flow even unto the new Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. I hope we would all see this dream. When I was reading this outline, I remember the testimony of our brother Lee. At that time, he was in the north of China. Then he came in contact with Watchman Nee. And then, you know, the Lord showed him that there is only one stream. There is only one stream. So he has to move from north of China to Shanghai to be with Watchman Nee. Oh, praise the Lord. Because Brother Lee saw this vision of the one stream and he came and joined in this one stream. Today, we have such a recovery. You know, if Brother Lee would not join in this one stream, maybe the recovery today is not what we are seeing today. But praise the Lord, he saw this and he joined in this one stream. You know, I like to share this testimony to you so that as we are looking at this one stream this divine stream the stream of life the stream of the holy spirit the stream of the body of christ the stream of fellowship we would all have this aspiration oh to be just in this one stream the bible reveals the flowing trying god praise the lord oh the trying god is a flowing trying god the Father as the fountain of life, the Son as the spring of life, and the Spirit as the river of life. Okay, He is showing us that He is the flowing fountain. He is the flowing, trying God. Oh, when we see this, oh, we must come to this fountain of life. We must come and drink of this fountain. We must be in this dream. If we don't, we may be committed one of the biggest evil that is described in Jeremiah 2.13. He says, so, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to hew out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, which hold no waters. You know, we want to be in this fountain. What should be our daily life? Our daily lives should be a life of drinking from this fountain of life. And when we come to John 4.14, 4, you know John 4.14 4, is actually a very wonderful verse. Because actually in half of this verse, you can see the purpose of the whole economy of God. Okay, John 4, 4 and 6 says, But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall by no means thirst forever. But the water that I would give him will become in him a spring of water springing up into eternity, eternal lives. Springing up into eternal life. You know what this is talking about? When this flow comes into us and we take this flow into us, by drinking of this flow, of this water of life, it will continue to flow until it flows out, flows out into this eternal life. And this consummation of the eternal life is actually the new Jerusalem. Oh, may the Lord really touch us so much. You know, every day of our life should be a drinking life. And B here says, the source of the flow is the throne of God and of the Lamb. And C said, in the scripture, there is only one flow, one divine stream. Since there is only one divine stream, and since the flow is uniquely one, we need to keep ourselves in this one flow. Oh, we need to keep ourselves in this one flow. And then D here says, the divine stream, the unique flow, is the stream of Lord's work. And in 1 Corinthians 16.10, 
He said, now if Timothy comes, see that he is with you without fear, for he is working the work of the Lord even as I am. You know, here, you know, Corinth, the church in Corinth, we all know has a lot of problems, right? But when Paul wrote something to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians, he is actually able to reveal to those saints in Corinth, you know, at least 20 aspects of this Christ. 20 aspects of this Christ. He's actually telling them, yes, you have problems, but what you need is the outflow of this very Christ. It's the flowing of this Christ. This Christ should be your enjoyment. This Christ should be your experience. And if you enjoy this Christ, if you experience this Christ, this Christ will solve all your problems. Oh, praise the Lord, our trying God is a flowing trying God. He is going to solve all our problems. All we need is to take him in. You know, just like, you know, Paul, he is working to make sure this flowing God is flowing. Timothy is doing the same. He's working as Paul is working. He's working the work of the Lord. You know, today, today in the church life, I hope we will all rise up. You know, we may see problems in the church, but we may all rise up. You know, what we do is not try to solve all those problems. What we do is to help one another to stay in this flow, in this unique flow, in this flow of the trying God. There is a stream, which we may call the stream, the current of the work. Where the stream flow, there is the work of God. The book of Acts revealed that in the move of the Lord, there is only one stream. And we need to keep ourselves in this one stream. We need to keep ourselves in this one stream. You know, some of the uh, references that we see here is from Acts 15. You know, Acts 15 came to a point when Barnabas and Paul did not quite agree with one another. Because Barnabas wanted to bring Mark with them to the next trip. But Paul doesn't think Mark is suitable because in the previous time when they traveled, Mark left them. Okay? But Barnabas, because Mark is his relative, wanted to bring Mark. You know, Barnabas wanted to bring Mark, but Paul doesn't want to bring Mark. So, you know, in chapter 15, verse 39, here it says, and there was a sharp contention, so that they separate from each other, and Barnabas taking Mark alone, sell away to Cyprus. Okay, so there was this sharp contention. And, you know, when co-worker contend with one another, we are actually being weakened by such contention. We need to understand this. Our contention doesn't just affect us, it affects the whole work of the Lord. So you hear, you see Barnabas. He has sharp contention with Paul. So the result is he brought, back, uh, brought Mark to Cyprus. You know, Cyprus is the hometown of Barnabas. So actually what this is being said here is Barnabas brought Mark to return home, to go back home. You know, that is what he did. But Paul went on. So in verse 40, it says, And Paul chose Silas and went out, and having commanded to the grace of the Lord by the brothers. You know, he, they, you know, Paul and Silas, have been commanded to the grace of the Lord by the brothers. You know, this is such a precious thing. We need to be commended to the grace of the Lord by the brothers. You know, it is so sad. Barnabas, who was so used by the Lord in the previous chapters of Acts, after this move, all his move, all his work, all his trouble, 
was never recorded again in the book of Acts. Okay. Okay, you know, in the church life, actually, it is quite easy to be offended. It is quite easy to have some contention such as this. That's why in many speaking, Brawley warn us you know, it is very easy for us to actually uh, stop the flow of the Lord by these three things. By unfulfilled ambition, by unforgiven offenses, and by our natural relationship. By our natural relationship. You know, don't think that in the Lord's recovery today, this will not happen because it did happen and it could happen again. In 1987-88, you know, we in Anaheim experienced this. You know, some of the co-workers who was in the recovery for so long in the 60s, you know, because of these three problems, they cannot go on with the Lord anymore. It is such a, such a sad thing. Okay. The flowing of the divine life, which started on the day of Pentecost and has been flowing throughout all generations to this day, is just one stream. And for say, the history of the church shows that throughout the generation, there has been one stream of the Spirit flowing all the time. Many have been working for the Lord. Listen, how many have been working for the Lord but not all have been in the flowing of that one's dream. You know, when we read this, I hope the Lord warn us, warn us very much. You know, we can be working for the Lord. We can say we are serving the Lord, but are we in this one's dream? Okay, Roman number two. The Lord appeared to Paul to bring him into the stream of the Lord's work, making him a minister and a witness both of the things in which Paul has seen him and the things in which he would appear to Paul. Okay, when we come to this verse, we should see you know, what the Lord has shown Peter, has shown Paul, you know, when, he, when, this, uh, when this was written, it's very good. But you know, the Lord wants to continue to appear to Paul. You know, this is not stopped just by Acts 9. Acts 9 is just a start. You know, the Lord must have continued to shine upon him, to show him so much. The Lord must have appeared to him again and again. You know, when I see this, you know, I, I really remember that Abraham was able to follow the Lord because the Lord appeared to him again and again. And Paul was able to go on because the Lord appeared to him again and again. And today, if we want to follow the Lord, if we want to remain in this one stream, in this divine stream, we need to ask the Lord. We need to pray to the Lord that he would continually appear to us. You know, every time we come together like this, I just hope that we are not here just to hear some doctrine, you know, all some truth, but we all ask the Lord that he would appear to us. Through his speaking, he would appear to us. He should appear to us again and again. So that we will be kept in this one stream. Okay. Oh, praise the Lord. You know, in uh, one of the things, when I was reviewing these things, came I remember there is a book called The Complete Ministry of Apostle Paul. Okay? And in that, in that book, there is a certain thing that Brother Lee mentioned, which he called the central vision. The central vision. You know, today we should be those people that is in the central vision so that we could be the 120 that is shown in the book of Acts. We want to be in that central vision so that we can be the 120 that follow the Lord in the fulfillment of his desire. 
Now, so there are two verses in Acts that I would like to read to you. One is in Acts 20:20, 20, 20, and also Acts 20:31. 20, you know, here Paul is saying something. Paul has seen something because he has seen something in such a deep way. You know, he behaved in a different way. You know, so when he works, he actually speaks to people according to the central vision that he has seen. That's why in Acts 20:20 20, 20, he could say, how I did not withhold any of those things, those things of the central vision, you know, that are profitable by not declaring them to you or by not teaching you publicly and from house to house. You know, Paul really saw something. You know, the Lord appeared to him. You know, he saw the central vision. And because of this, it makes him to have such a burden to speak to the people by declaring to them the central vision publicly and from house to house. Today, in the church life, I believe all the churches, you know, we have prophesying meeting in the Lord's day morning, right? I think most of us have such time. You know, that is a time where we afford us the way, oh, to declare what the Lord is doing publicly. So that's one way. But Paul did not just stop with that one way. He also go and visit people from house to house. You know, yesterday we heard, you know, one tear is worth 10 messages. Broly also said, one visit is worth 10 messages. You know, so, you know, that's why, you know, Paul visit people from house to house. Maybe while he is visiting them, he visit them with tears, admonishing them with tears. Oh, today, if we want our churches to go on, we need to speak publicly on the Lord's Day morning. We should go visit the saints from house to house. You know, I don't know if you know, Victor, in the church in Anaheim, we have District 2. And one of the two of the leaders there is Rick Scatterday and Eric Romero. You know, they actually try to visit every house, every house in that district. You know, they try to go visit. You know, when I heard this, I just heard this recently. I was so touched. You know, I need to repent to the Lord. I'm in District 3. I probably go to a handful of houses because I'm traveling all the time. You know, but the Lord really touched me by this. <laughs> that we need to speak, we need to teach publicly, and from house to house. And then Acts 20, 31 said, Therefore watch, remember, that for three years, night and day, I did not cease admonishing each one with tears. You know, so if you put these two verses together, when he visited people, he admonished them with tears. Okay, in A here it says, oh, this is the pattern that we see in Paul. And so I just hope that the Lord, oh, would also burden us to follow such a pattern. You know, even in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, he went to visit the house of Simon the leper. He went to visit the house of Simon the leper. You know, I was wondering, if I was there, I probably would not go to the house of a leper because I don't know if I'm going to be, you know, contaminated. <laughs> At that time, leprosy is not curable. You know, but the Lord doesn't care. You know, he went to the house of the leper. You know, in the God of Denwick, messages from Brother Lee. You know, he said from house to house. That means you go to every house. You don't choose the house. You know, but sometimes we think, oh, this house, we can go. That house, no puede. Okay. We'll say, 
Isn't it true? Is it from house to house? Mean from good house to good house. But this is not the meaning of this verse. He went from house to house. That means to every house. Okay. And A here, please. Paul was not disobedient to the heavenly vision of man as a vessel to contain, to fill with and express the process and consummated trying God of Christ as the ministry of God and the church as the body of Christ, the mystery of Christ. You know, Paul was not disobedient. This is the central vision that we are talking about. So how about let's read the central vision, which is in A. Okay, let's read A, please. Paul was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Okay, B here says, once you have seen a vision of God's plan and have been converted. You have seen and you have lived. You must be converted from everything to Christ himself. There will be something within you, energizing you to carry out God's plan. This vision will become your burden. As you live and labor in the continuation of the book of Acts. Oh, I hope that we see. But this see, you know, we need to see a vision and this vision should be the word that we convey to others. This vision should become our burden. Okay, Roman number three. In Acts 26, 18. Okay, I would like to read you Acts 28, 26, 18 so we understand what we are talking about. Acts 26, 18 says, To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the authority of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Okay, this is Acts 26, 18. And this is actually Paul's commission. And such commission should also be our commission. Acts 26, 18 reveals the work that we must do today for the increase and building up of the body of Christ in the continuation of the book of Acts. This verse unveils the all-inclusive content of our divine commission. This is Paul commission, this is the divine commission, this is our commission. You know, actually, this is a full and complete and perfect gospel. You know, here, Acts 26, 18 is such a gospel. A here says, this is to carry out the fulfillment of God's jubilee. The acceptable year of the Lord proclaimed by the Lord Jesus in Luke 4, verses 18 to 21, according to God's New Testament economy. Okay, in these verses, you know, you know Paul, the Lord proclaimed this, you know, saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to announce the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release of the captive and the recovery of the sight of the blind, to send away and release those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee. Okay, so this is what the Lord has shared in Luke 4. And so when the Lord appeared to Paul, he also sees such a thing. So, praise the Lord for Paul's commission. Praise the Lord for this divine commission. You know, if we see such a commission, we must pray for this commission. That's why B here says, we need to pray over the content of our divine commission in Acts 26, 18. Asking the Lord to make them our experience and reality so that we can bring other into the experience and reality. You know, when we see verse like this, it is good for us to dwell in this verse with much prayer and consideration. Oh, we need to pray this, this verse so that what is being spoken in this verse would actually become our experience. 
You know, everything that is said in this verse should become our experience. You know, like it says to open their eyes. You know, if you want to open people's eyes, your eyes need to be open. You know, so you should pray to the Lord, Lord, open my eyes so that I can be in this divine commission to open other people's eyes. And when it says to turn them from darkness to light, you should consider where are you? Maybe you are in darkness. If you're in darkness, you cannot bring people from darkness to a light. So you must pray. Pray, Lord, bring me out of darkness. We cannot remain in darkness. And then it says, you know, from the authority of Satan to God, who is actually ruling your life? Is it God or is it Satan? You know, who rules you? Under what kind of reign are you? If you are under the reign of God, then you can bring people out of the authority of Satan to God. Oh, you pray, you pray so much for your forgiveness. You know, the Lord needs to touch us that we need to pray daily for the forgiveness of the Lord. There are so many sins that we know. There's also so many sins that we don't know. We need to pray. You know, many times when you pray with Brother Lee, he would pray that the Lord will forgive him. You know, we would think, you know, Brother Lee, Brother Lee doesn't need too much of this kind of prayer. But he always prayed, you know, that we must receive the forgiveness of the Lord. Okay? So that we can be sanctified in order to be able to receive the inheritance that the Lord has prepared for us. We need to pray. Okay? So the content of this verse is divided into all these sub-points here. Okay? And the first point is to open their eyes. To open their eyes. You know, I'm so glad for this outline because it actually brings us into so many of the details that we need to understand. Okay? He said to open their eyes. We need to continually pray. You know, many times it will tell us to pray. If you want your eyes to be open, what do you do? You pray. We need to pray, continually pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to understand and to see more and more of Christ, the body of Christ, and the divine dispensing for the divine economy. You know, all these three things, you know, need much prayer. You need much prayer because all these things is in the divine and mystical realm. You know, Brother Lee one time said, to see the church is easier, but to see the body of Christ is a lot more difficult. Because in the church, there are still some practical things. There are still some outward things. But when you talk about the body of Christ, it's fully in the divine and mystical realm. That's why we need to continually pray, you know, for the wisdom, uh, for the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that we can understand, okay? And we can see more and more of Christ, the body of Christ, and the divine dispensing of the divine economy. Okay. I hear in Matthew 6.6, 6, he said, you know, for us to be able to see this, for us to be able to see this, we need a secret life. Okay, we know a secret life. And what is Matthew 6.6 6 talking about? He said, but you, when you pray, enter into your private room and shut your door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will repay you. You know, this secret is that we need to spend time with the Lord. Okay, we need to spend time with the Lord. You know, pray to the Lord. It is very good for us to come to the church meeting, to the prayer meeting of the church. But, you know, we also need this private time with the Lord. This secret time with the Lord. This is where you have the root system. This root system is hidden. You know, nobody sees the root. But without the root, you know, the plant can never grow. We need such a life. Let's consider, you know, how much time do we spend with the Lord? You know, so many of us are leading ones. So many of us are serving ones. You know, we are so busy doing so many outward things. 
But please remember, you need a proper root system. You need a time where we can absorb all the riches of this Christ so that you will be able to serve according to God. Okay? And then B here says, We cannot go on without new knowledge of the Lord and the new vision of Him. Okay? New knowledge of the Lord and new vision of Him. For you to consider this point, probably it's good for us to go to Deuteronomy 4, 25. Here it says, when he had brought forth children and grandchildren and have languished in the land, and he was spoiled Yosef by making an idol and forms of anything, and have done that which is evil in the sight of Jehovah your God, so as to anger him. You know, this is talking, Deuteronomy is actually talking to the children of Israel. You know, but before they went into the good land, you know, Moses has to remind them. You know, these things about languishing. Languishing. You know, what is the meaning of languishing? Actually, if you want to find the meaning of languishing, you could go to that verse, and there is a footnote there. There is a footnote on this word called languishing. It's languishing actually imply the loss of spiritual freshness. You know, to languish in the land, that means you have lost the spiritual freshness. And it also includes the blunting of the original impress that produces the force of custom or long, you know, long resident on the same spot. You know, here it's talking about, you know, because these Israelites, they may stay in one place for a long time, you know, and they started to languish. You know, I just hope that we here in the churches in the Philippines will not languish. How do you say language in Tagalog? Huh? How do you say it? Lingwan? Yeah, you know, it is. If you go, to, okay, forget about it. I will stick with the English. <laughs> Languishing means, you know, that we would lose the freshness. Okay? We cannot lose freshness. Okay, don't translate anymore. We, would not, we want to have new knowledge of the Lord. We want to have new vision of the Lord. You know, but by talking about this verse, it's actually saying that if we remain in the same spot of the same residence for too long, we lose the freshness. We lose the freshness. You know, I, I am glad in the Lord's recovery, we talk so much also about migrations. You know, by migrating, you could see people got fresh. You know, Victor and I know of a brother from this Latin America. And recently he fellowship with us, he wants to move to Germany. And so he moved. Oh, I am so glad when I saw him in Germany. He is another person. You know, in his homeland, in one of those countries in Latin America, he has been there since birth. He knows everyone. Everyone knows him. So it loses all the freshness. Oh, but praise the Lord. By moving to Germany where nobody knows him. Oh, praise the Lord. He has new vision and new knowledge of the Lord. You know, talking about the Philippines, I am so glad, you know, that what the Lord is doing in the Philippines is not just for the Philippines. Have you ever thought about that? You know, look at all the, what do you call it? Overseas worker? OFW? What is F for? Overseas Filipino worker? You know, they are everywhere. Everywhere. You know, if you go to the U.S., especially to the hospitals, you can speak Tagalog. 
and everything would be just fine. <laughs> and if you go to Saudi Arabia, you know, to, to all those Arabic countries, there's so many Filipinos. You know, what the Lord is doing here is actually for the entire world. So we should not, you know, we should see what the Lord is doing among us. We have no time to waste. We all need to get this burden, this burden of the divine commission. So we do not just live for ourselves, but we live for the Lord. Okay, let me go on. Being a minister and a witness is not a matter of teaching of knowledge, but of appearing in vision. The things in which we have seen the Lord and the things in which the Lord will appear to us are the things that we must minister to others. So we must keep on seeing what the Lord wants to appear to us. Our commission is to enlighten all that they may see what the economy of the mystery is. Oh, praise the Lord. Huh? And then the second part is to turn them from darkness to light. To turn them from darkness to light. And A here says, okay, there are so many things about light here. You know, to put all these verses here together is really wonderful. You know? He said, light is the presence of God. Light is the presence of God. And you can see that's from Isaiah 2, 5, you know. Walk in the light of Jehovah. And then also in 1 John 1, 5, you could see, you know, God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And then B here said, we need to be people who are full of light. You know, we need to be people full of light. Just not a little light, it's full of light. You know, like Luke 11, 31 said, you know, we have to be full of life. And then 11, 36, it said, if therefore your whole body is full of light and does not have any dark part, the whole will be full of light as when the lamp with its ray illuminates you okay so we need to turn people from this light by being the light okay now when we come to see he said the enjoyment of Christ as our God given portion is in the light is in the light this allotted portion that we receive is actually in the light you know all these verses is so precious you know first you know a while ago we talked about first John 1 5 God is light and then in John 8 12 we see that Christ is light because Christ said I am the light of the word I am the light of the world okay he's the light of the word and this light is the light of life and if you go to Psalm 119 105 he said your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path so the word is light if you go to 119, 130, you know, there it says, you know, the, the opening of your word gives life. So here it's also talk about the word is life. You know, the opening of the word gives life and impart understanding to the simple. And if you go to Matthew 514, you know, 514 says something even more precious. It says that you are the light of the world. Oh, praise the Lord. Have you ever thought about this? You are the light of the world. Okay, in Revelation 1.20, it says that the church is the light. Because the church is the golden lampstand shining for this light to illuminate the world. Okay, so we are all light. Oh, praise the Lord. You know, so God is light, Christ is light, life is light, the world. The word in you is light. You are light. And the church is light. And I love this verse in Ephesians 5, 8 to 9. It says, once you are darkness. You know, you are darkness. You know, you are not just in darkness. You are darkness. But now, light in the Lord. We are light in the Lord. Because we are light in the Lord, we can actually turn people from darkness to light. Okay, and then he said we need to illuminate the world holding forth 
the word of life, you know, by living out Christ. And he said we need to tell out, we need to tell out by testifying the virtue of the one who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Into his marvelous light. You know, in the book of Acts, you know, three times we see the testimony of Paul. You know, how he tells the virtues, you know, virtues, you know, of the one who has called him out of darkness into the marvelous light. And I believe, you know, many of us really has such experience. We should not keep those experiences to ourselves. We should go out and tell out these virtues. And then three here said to turn them from the authority of Satan to God. A here said the highest point in our spiritual experience is to have a clear sky with the throne above it. And then one is said to have the throne above a clear sky is to give the Lord the preeminence in our being and the highest and the most prominent position in our life. Okay? That is to have a clear sky. Oh, may the Lord give us clear sky. The clearer our sky is, the more we are under the throne, under God's authority. For God to have the throne in us means that he has the position to reign in us. Do the Lord have position to reign in us? You know, in our management, in our administration of the church life, in our care for the saints, in our shepherding, I hope we are all under the reign of God. Oh, we all stay in the position under the reign of God in us. And then four says, if we are under the clear sky with the throne above it, genuine authority will be with us to bring others under God's authority. Okay, and then B here says, our uttermost love for the Lord qualifies, perfects, and equips us to speak for the Lord with his authority. You know, the uttermost love, the first love would qualify us. Okay, then four says, that they may receive forgiveness of sin. We need to go to the Lord to receive authority of forgiveness for all our sins. And David here, you know, this prayer of David is really wonderful in Psalm 51.1. He said, David begged God to blot out his transgression, wash him thoroughly from his iniquity, and cleanse him from his sin, and purge out his sins with his sob. You know, and probably in one of the, uh, in one of the ministries talking about, we you know when David prayed here, he really prayed a genuine forgiven prayer. That's why he could say, you know, he could say, you know, may the Lord blot out his transgression. May the Lord cleanse him. You know, and then the Lord purged out his sins. Okay, let's read one, please. He's up. Okay, two. Okay, three. Let's pray for the gift of repentance from God. If you go to Acts 11, 18, Paul and Peter said there, God has given repentance unto life. That means you know, this repentance is a gift from God to us. So may the Lord give us such gift of repentance. And in 5 he says that they may receive an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. You know, first of all, we need to be sanctified by faith. And when we are sanctified by faith in Him, then we can receive all the allotted portion for the saints. And in that, you know, we get brought into the church life for the fuller experience of all the things that the Lord is giving us. So, how about let's read A, B, C, and D. A brothers, B sisters, C brothers, and D sisters. Sisters. Huh? Oh, they don't have outlines? Okay, brothers, todos.
Amen. You know, as we receive all this inheritance, we need to bring people into the enjoyment of this all-inclusive Christ. Okay, let's go to four. You know, you know, this is really a burden that as we come to the end of this conference, we would come to this point in Roman number four. If we would be in the continuation of the book of Acts, we need to continue to live in the divine history by having an upper room consecration. By having an upper room consecration. You know, this is what happened. You know, so many people follow the Lord, but only 120 remains after the death and resurrection of Christ. And these are the 120, and they went to the upper room. And in that upper room, they have this upper room consecration. And A here says, at the seashore. You know, at the seashore, you know, the Lord called Peter. And Peter was able to give up his job as a fisherman to follow the Lord. You know, we may think that is a great thing, you know, for people to serve God full time. But this is still not enough. So here it says, at the seashore, Paul gave up his, his job to follow the Lord Jesus. But in the upper room, he gave up much more. He stood with the heavenly vision to give up the religion of the forefather, to give up his country, his relationship with his neighbors and friends and his relatives. And he was willing to actually risk his life. And then B here says, the kind of consecration that we need today is an upper room consecration. That means, you know, just to have the seashore consecration is not enough. We need the upper room consecration. A consecration in which we pay the price to have our whole being married to the heavenly vision. Our whole being married to the heavenly vision. And see, he said, if we pay the price for the heavenly vision, we will burn the bridges before, behind us and we'll have no way to go backward. Okay? You know, so many times we say, don't burn the bridges. But here we say, we burn the bridges so that we don't go back. We don't want to live a back door out. And then he said, whether we have been, we have seen the heavenly vision or not depends on whether we are willing to pay the price to buy the anointing spirit as the eyes have. So again, here we say, we need to pray to the Lord that he will shine upon us so that we can see the preciousness of what he is after. We want to see the heavenly vision is in entirety so that we will be willing to pay the price. And F here says, F it says, to take the way of the Lord's recovery is not cheap. This way is expensive and require a costly consecration. You know, this time when this speaking, this message was spoken in Ethiopia, you know, one day, you know, the Ethiopian gave us, you know, the Ethiopian from Addis Ababa gave us their testimony. You know, when they, when they want to take the way of the Lord's recovery, all their friends becomes their enemy. You know, it is really sad, you know, but, you know, that's what happened. So they have to pay the price. In another locality, which is in the southwest of Addis Ababa, you know, another group of people actually saw this heavenly vision, and they are willing to f follow and take the ground as the local church in that area. And their friends, when they saw this, you know, persecute them so much. So they are not able to meet. They have to go to the jungles to meet, to pray to the Lord in the jungles. And they testify that as they are fellowshipping and enjoying the Lord, the baboons are watching them. They praise the Lord in front of the baboons because all their friends rejected them and are persecuting them. You know, they really paid the price. You know, I really praise the Lord for bringing me to Ethiopia to see the work of the Lord. And I really believe that is the work of the Holy Spirit, not the work of men. Okay? And then F here said, we are not here for a movement, but for the Lord's recovery. And the recovery can be carried out only by the specific, extraordinary consecration in the upper room. The 120 in the upper room all became a burn offering 
Of course, we know the bread offering is Christ. But by enjoying this Christ, we can be identified with this Christ as the burnt offering. He is the only one that is absolute. And by being identified with him, we can also be the absolute one. They were burning for the Lord in spirit, and they burned others with the divine fire of the divine life. And then Edge says, when the Lord Jesus was on earth, great crowd followed him, but they did not afford him anything for his move. His move was with those in the upper room, with those whose eyes have been opened and whose heart has been touched. We want our eyes to be open, our heart to be touched. You know, I really hope and pray that we will all go back to all these messages, that this will not just go to our bookshelves, that we would read and reread all these things so that our eyes would be open. So that our heart would be touched by the Lord. It is a small number who will turn the world and change the age. If we would be in the upper room, do you want to be in the upper room? If we would be in the upper room, we need to pray in a specific, specific way and say it. Okay, let's say, Lord, I'm willing to be in the upper room for the recovery of your testimony. Oh, may the Lord have mercy on us. May the Lord have mercy on all the churches in the Philippines, from the north to the south. Amen.